Oh, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the uh, 50, 530th meeting of Canterbury Regional Council. Uh, today we have uh, two uh, groups uh, and one, uh, one group and an individual presenting in our public forum. So I'd just like to um, welcome uh, Penny Carnaby and um, I haven't got your name, but Kate White. Kate White. Oh, sorry. I can't see that far to tell you the truth. Um, <laughs> I can see you there, but I can't see actual details of who you actually are. So sorry about that. Just show my age. Um, and so welcome, but we're not going to have you quite yet. I'm just saying welcome to you. And we'd also, I'd also like to really welcome um, Axel Wilkie, who's um, made time to come as an individual along to council and talk to us about exciting near future transport opportunities. So Axel, we'll hear from you in a minute or two. Um, so it's really lovely to have you all here. And without any further ado, I'll invite um, Councillor Craig Pauling um, to give, present us a mehi whakatau. A te nei te ruru te koko mai nei ki hai mafa te piti ki hai mara kara kadu poko nui te ruru te reko he po he po he ao kau te ati he mauri ora. Ah kina kina atua kirunga rawa a ho mau kaha ho mau aroha ki a mato te nei wa. Ah kau i taku fakaro kina te nei atua ku e e he atu ki te po haere haere haere. A rato ki a rato tato ki a tato te hunga ora ah te nei koto. Uh, tēnā koutou, uh, uh, nā rangatera, ka hara mai nei uh, uh, i tēnei hui uh, ki te koero o, o tō kaupapa, uh, Penny, uh, Kate, Axel, uh, nau mai hara mai. Uh, ai, nau mai hara mai, uh, kei, ru, kei runga i te, o raru i te tūnui o tēnei whari o tātou, uh, kei rotu i te rohi o nai, tura, uh, nai tua hūreri, uh, ai, nei rā te mihi ki a koutou, uh, ki nā ringa raupā, Nā kai mai o te kaunihera nei, a nā kai kaunihera, a tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, a tēnā koutou. Ka hoa atu te rākau a, ki a Tumutai o Cranwell, a mō te karakia. Kia ora tātou. Tōkuna te raki e tū, whakateke teke te tūra nui o pai, kurua tipua, kurua tawhito. Tōku e tāne, ko tōku mauka, raki hiki tiki e, raki hāpai, kā e tū. Ko te raki e tū nei, me te papa e tāko tō nei. Tū mau mai, te rā e tū nei, a tama i wahu i a tama o kotahi. Te pū take tama i te tā mori mori nui, te pū take tama i te raki tū hā hā eki o ki te raki e tū nei. Fiti fiti nuku, fiti fiti raki, fiti fiti papa, fiti fiti tau. Tū te maharo nui, tū te maharo roa, tū te maharo nui e tū nei. Tā whi ki a raki. Ki a tama i waho, tu turi whakamaua, ki a tīna. Au mie huie tāi ki e. Mauri ora. Thank you very much, Councillor Craig Pauling, and thank you, Tumu Taia, Yain Cramwell, for that karakia. We'll just move on with the formalities of the meeting now. Apologies. We don't have any apologies, but Councillor Farn, you indicated you might be leaving a bit early. Uh, so we'll just um, note the time you leave when you leave. Thanks very much. Uh, conflicts of interest. We haven't got any further conflicts of interest being notified. Uh, so as I've already said for our public forum today, it's very exciting um, to have um, the Banks Minister um, Conservation Trust Chair and uh, Kate White here today. So um, over to you to present and you've got a slideshow. So thank we have. Um, oh, we have about 10 minutes, and at 9 minutes, we have to sell. Okay. Just calmly, actually. Calmly. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, Moreno koutou, um, Namihi Nui o Tenei Rā. Um, it is a great pleasure to, um, to be able to talk to you about some of the things Kate and I feel so passionately about. Um, and um, apologies from Marie Burnett, who was supposed to be giving this presentation, Marie's not well at the moment, so you've got me um, and I, I will do my best. Um, what I want to do um, this morning is um, really uh, go very quickly through some um, um, 
grounding issues around the Banks Miniature Conservation Trust um, and some of the issues that we're thinking about at the moment. And I'm really just signaling some more conversations with you. Um, but I'll be moving right through um, quite quickly to um, a discussion with you uh, about a bulk funding a pr proposal uh, that we'd like you to consider. So um, we're basically, I think it is important to know that the trust was established in 2001, became a covenanting authority in 2003, the only independent covenanting authority, as I understand it, in New Zealand, and um, alongside with the same uh, um, um, regulatory environment as QE2 Trust. So um, that's fairly important because it, it, in, in the early days that the trust was set up, and, and supported by landowners on Banks Peninsula and um, um, to work constructively with some of the regulatory environment that was testing their thinking. If we fa fast forward 20 years, uh, you will know how uh, relevant that is today as there are considerable number of regulations to work through. The trust um, is, we, we're working on six programs. Um, I'm, and I'm only going to um, talk about the last one, habitat protection and enhancement, uh, largely around covenanting. I, I put Pest Free Banks Peninsula there because um, you will know that so well. And all I need to say about that is that it is going amazingly well. We've just appointed 14 staff um, and it's um, very exciting uh, for those of you who have been to the community programs. Um, the context of what we talk about all the time at the moment is climate change. Um, biodiversity, um, carbon sequestration are the two fundamental issues around climate change uh, that underpins all of the biodiversity work that the Trust does. And the covenanting process um, means that uh, biodiversity, um, natural, um, and natural habitation is protected forever, and that is a huge contribution uh, to the uh, climate. Uh, climate um, conundrums. Banks Peninsula is an interesting kind of place, as we all know, but it, it, I, I put this up because it, it, it is important just to look at how we're situated. Um, all of those valleys, um, we've just been talking with the um, uh, Water Zone Committee about um, uh, working with ECAN, a, a joint project um, uh, on catchment areas, supporting landowners, um, and if you look at, at Banks Peninsula, it's it's the influence on the whole of Canterbury and those Canterbury Plains. Um, if we get the biodiversity on Banks Peninsula right, it's contributing far more um, um, to the the whole environment around us. So um, the one of the bits of work that Kate and I have just been doing is working with um, partner organisations like yourselves. Um, on, on getting input into the 2050 ecological vision for Banks Peninsula, um, including the Port Hills. We've been consulting with over, um, well, around about 15 uh, different groups, um, agencies, and um, basically to see if anything needs to change uh, since the uh, 2016 um, uh, vision was launched uh, by the Minister of Conservation. There have been great conversations and I think importantly, um, if you, one of the things that is, it's important to know about the trust is that, that we think we do more by working together. Um, we, we, uh, one of the signatures of the trust is the ability to bring together collaborations of agencies, um, landowners and, and all sorts of other aligned organisations. And that's what we do best. And we, we, we're doing it with the uh, Pest Free Banks Peninsula. And um, it's it's a very important the the ecological vision in that context. So let me now turn to the issues because this is really what I want to talk to you about today. Um, with the habitat protection the BBC, by BBCT Covenant, it it really is a very powerful um, legal mechanism um, that ensures the protection and ecological values. And I talked about the same uh, having the same rigor as the QE2 Covenant. It is a gift for future generations. It's not just for Banks Peninsula residents. It's a, a, the peninsula is a jewel of biodiversity uh, across the um, uh, uh, across Canterbury, really. Um, the upfront costing of a covenant is really quite significant, uh, but the bulk of the ongoing management costs are often met by the landowners 
and this represents, uh, we think, excellent value for money. Uh, we have at the moment um, covenant over 19 covenants registered, and this is the thing to notice. 21 are currently um, unfunded and waiting for funding. We have 41 expressions of interest. Just think about that. That's a huge, I mean, there's something happening on the peninsula where landowners are wanting to covenant their land and protect it, and it's very exciting. Um, and we're doing ecological surveys. Each of the covenants has a whole management plan around them. And um, as well as the, the we, we run a covenant support program, an education program uh, for these covenants. And of course, we have the support of landowners. Um, I'm going to skip through this slide. This one's interesting. This is the wild side, which is the focus area for um, uh, the pest-free Banks Peninsula. Those red spots uh, constitute Banks Peninsula um, um, covenants, and uh, we're, we're working together with other covenanting organisations, and we're joining it up. <laughs> and it's 25% uh, of the land on in the wild side on Banks Peninsula is now uh, protected. And I think we should be sell you, ECAN should be very proud of that because you've been a huge part in it. Um, we have worked with you very closely on funded covenants. Um, this slide shows all the uh, 2021 um, covenants with ECAN, and they're extensive and co covering many different um, um, ecological values on the peninsula. But what we what we are suggesting today is that, and, and asking you to consider. Is, is to, um, you've been incredibly generous in supporting us um, over the years. Um, and, and in fact, the, the covenants from the uh, last two years, you've supported to the tune of um, $246,262. Um, but the issue is we think there's a better way of doing it. And what we're, what we're asking you today is to consider, and we're going to ask the council exactly the same thing, we think by bulk funding us um, to the tune of $250,000 per year over three years, and we're going to ask the council to do exactly the same, we will get a real um, step change in the, num the numbers of covenants that we can um, um, you know, protect. And um, it, it also is a much more efficient way of doing it. We, at the moment, we come to you and you've never turned us down. Uh, you obviously trust us and thank you for that. Um, but it, it isn't all that efficient for you or for us. Um, we think we can do far more, um, much better uh, capacity to deliver. Um, um, and if we can report to you once a year, uh, a meaningful annual report, rather than um, covenant by covenant by covenant. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, 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 we, we really do give a value add with our covenants. We wrap an education program around it. Uh, we're constantly monitoring um, what's happening, and we 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 work with um, um, uh, the QE2 trust because they're not able to run those programs. But but the 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 basically the people and the landowners of Banks Peninsula have a, um, a, a well attending a lot of these workshops and wilding pines and all sorts of things. So look, that's basically what I'm asking for: a guaranteed bulk funding program. Um, and I think it, it, it does enable us to, would enable us to explore new corporate partnerships. Once we've got a, we know what, rather than worrying about the money, knowing it's there, I think all of us, um, and particularly um, your ability to, to monitor the strategic impact of, of your investment, uh, I think it, it's much tighter. So I will end there and, and um, take any questions. Oh, thank you very much, um, Penny. That's an excellent um, presentation and it really makes it clear to us and the maps are really good. So thank you very much. We'll start out with our councillor, Farm. Yeah, thank you, Penny and Kate and your team for such incredible work. Um, I just wanted to um, dive a bit deeper into um, what your slide where you talk about the current covenant projects yeah. and the um, expressions of interest. Um, because at Environment Canterbury, we're particularly focused on, you know, actual biodiversity outcomes and delivering, yes. as you are yourselves. Um, but the 21 current covenant projects, can you give us an idea of like what state are they in? Like, are they literally like sitting there 
ready to go or you know like yeah, on the oh sorry and your button again oh, sorry. i can't um off the top of my head deliver i'm afraid exact detail but um the 21 that are in process uh um will be going through from everything from um looking for funding uh through to um uh, and, and ecological assessment, working with the landowner to get the best outcome around how to um, uh, fence that appropriately and take in the appropriate pieces, those discussions around that and looking for funding and moving it through to the next stage. And in order for that to be efficient for the trust, we've set up a process whereby for us to deliver to that, we, we have a deed with the landowner. So it's um an agreement that it's it, it, it is worthwhile for us to pursue this they've agreed that this is what they want to do and that it's worth taking time to spend yeah. your time to yeah. look at those funding proposals so they're all in that kind of sphere yeah. the expressions of interest are more people that are coming to us saying we're interested and we're saying well, we haven't got time right now mm. um uh, but we'll get back to you when we can but with with the bulk funding um in, enveloped in that is some extra staffing capacity. Our Covenant officer is absolutely run off her feet. And what um, Marie Burnett is saying is that with the bulk funding, um, it will concertina the time it takes to get us a, a Covenant through. At the moment, it's our capacity, um, not capability, um, if, if you get what I mean. So it, it enfolded in that in that bulk funding is is an ability to move more quickly. Um, on covenants that we are at the, uh, able to do at the moment, because we've got one person trying to do it all. Yeah. Well, thank you. So the next person was Councillor Vicky Southworth. That's lovely. Thank you for the presentation, which is just a lot of times peninsula. Um, in terms of the list of 41, so you've got 21 which you've already got, and then you've got 41 waiting. Do you will you go through a process of prioritising those? Do you look at the environment or the strategy you have and work out which one to prioritise? Very much. We, um, we've got a set of ecological criteria that have to be met. Um, and it has a slight social dimension to it as well. And it's a strategic approach where there's networks building up, but they have to meet. Um, they're usually an SES of some sort and a recommended area for protection under the PNA report. Um, uh, so, um, or, or if they're not an ecological uh, SES, they will they will be within that report as just below that measure. So the up and coming forest that's coming below that. Mm. So, um, yep, no, we go through it. And they're all um, linking to the um, ecological vision for Banks Peninsula. So that there will be one of those eight goals will will be ticked off. Or several. Or several. Yeah follow on to that is is in terms of monitoring so once they've been covenanted do you then have a mechanism for monitoring checking that they stay within the quality that we do we have a at the moment our capacity means oh we, we have a it's five yearly we go around we check fences we make sure that the weeds and the pests are being managed and that the landowner is is and and the, a big part of the component of that isn't just the monitoring it's actually reminding the landowners how fantastic it is and just sharing sharing that vision and um and i think that fostering is a big part of our program um and as well but that it's conversation as well but it's it's also photo point monitoring um some of them have got uh plots because we have different habitat types and we're trying to monitor that over time how mm. each of those are going it's Yes. I, I can assure you it's rigorous. Um, we've just covenanted our own place in um, Banks Peninsula and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's extremely special, but it's also, you don't take it lightly. Mm. Um, the next speaker, Councillor Phil Clearwater. Uh, Jenny, my question is actually more a process, process question as to how we actually um, deal with the, the funding request in, in effect really. Oh, Sorry. I think that's all right to ask that now, or the council staff right to um, come back to us on that. Yeah. I think what we'd like to do is be able to take this away and have a korero, actually, with the Banks Minister Conservation Trust, and come back to you as councillors with regard to what options there might be, if that's all right, Chair. 
was thinking that we do need to know all that, so that's excellent if you do that. Uh, Councillor Ian um, McKenzie, you're next. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I was just wondering uh, what your connection, if any, is with QE2 Trust and, and whether you guys work hand in hand. Um, the, uh, certainly uh, the QE2 Trust, um, in terms of the um, regulatory environment, we're very parallel in terms of the you know the powers, the enforcement, the um, all of that. So they're, they're exactly the same. And and look, it's just a personal relationship. I've I've, I've just um, I've met recently with the CEO of QE2. Um, we invite QE2 because it, they're the whole of Canterbury, and uh, their capacity to offer the value add, I guess, to landowners um, in terms of education programs and things. We always invite them. Um, so that's the relationship. It, it, it is a very good one uh, between the two trusts. I can add to that in terms of efficiencies around covenanting. I mm. mean, in the past, um, a big portion of our funding has come through ECAN with Immediate Steps program. Part of the problem is that it's no longer there. Um, and um, the way that's to get the best benefit from DASH and the water zone, we actually work alongside QE2. They, they can... Um, they, they can do four covenants um, a year, um, and um, and they have certain you know they have certain things that they can offer or not offer that we can offer, and so we try and actually work strategically around that to get the best benefits for Banks Peninsula, and so the organisations mm. are looking to the same goals, and so it's not a competitive process at all. Thank you, our uh, councillor Peter Scott. But thank you, and thank you for the terrific work you do um, in terms of your, you know, your time that you spend, and I think you're you're marvellous, really. Um, but change, I guess, changing the model is, is what you're looking at to be more efficient and to do more, and and that changes what your outcomes going to be, obviously, in terms of doing that. And I think my question has been answered by the fact that we need to dig a bit deeper. I mean, our audit trail into this is going to be different uh, because you can't actually. And, and we need to understand what you're talking about, I guess, in more detail. So, but thank you for your work. Thank you. Yeah, the um, uh, we have um, the, the, there is a background paper that um, it, is being written, um, which will give you more more background as you want to delve into it. It's just Marie's not being well that we couldn't give it to you today. Um, so that 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 might. Um, might might be helpful in terms of giving you a bit more detail. And as I said, we're going to be talking to the council. We think it's uh, uh, both councils um, that have a responsibility here or, or yeah, uh, can contribute. It's great that you're talking to um, the people across the way. Ca uh, Councillor Pauling. Oh, uh, tuatahi, uh, ka nui to me. Uh, kia, kia kōrua, kia koutou hoki uh, tō Ropu or Bank Bunch of Conservation Trust uh, mō tō Koto uh, mahi uh, i faka hauanga na na rako na manu uh, uh, or te pataka rako hotu. Uh, so just thanking thanking you, of course, uh, your trust for the work you do. Like others have said, um, doesn't go unnoticed, and it's really exciting to see what's going on. Um, yeah, I, I sort of have a few. I have a couple of questions and just a bit of a, a thought as well. Um, you know, we had quite a big discussion around the council table in LTP over the Mururako program and we did land some money for that which is really great. Um, we did discuss um, the Bank Country Conservation Trust and thought about funding but we weren't quite clear on exactly what the need was I suppose. So now that this is really good that it's coming forward so I'm still what I'd really like to know is um, how much money of course but we can discuss that later not right here but um, but also, in particular, you know, how many more Coventing officers will it take to get through that um, backlog of the 21 plus the 41 coming? That would be really good to know so that we can have some clear targets on what that could be about. Um, you can respond. Yeah. Um, does that, those are your questions? Oh, yeah. Question. Um, yes, the, the, um, we, we have folded in an extra day um, into this funding. Uh, to, uh, I, I can't answer exactly. I know it'll speed it up. Um, I know more would help an enormous amount, but but we, we're fairly realistic about fundings needing to go. Uh, but there's no doubt that uh, 
more staffing capacity would equal more governance yeah, more quickly. Yeah. How did that capacity all come from just just um, the efficiency to um, of 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 that of delivering um, both the reporting to you and the and the request? Um, but but I just also want to point out just how much voluntary time goes into these covenants. I I know you probably understand, but there's um, 12 of us around the table that are all going out talking to landowners. The, um, the ongoing monitoring is supported by volunteers that go out and hold the sticks and weeding. Weeding. <laughs> so so the covenant officer at the moment she's delivering all of this on three days a week full time. <laughs> So, you know, they all put in more than their days, you know. Um, so she's phen phenomenal, really. Um, so I think it's, um, mm. I just needed to say that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think where Ian was going, I think there, it would be good to have a conversation with QE2 as well about the, we did give him some funding. So the extra capacity and how that could uh, be brought to bear might be interesting as well. Um, and I do know, and this is sort of to Phil's point, um, we do have our next Natural Environment Committee meeting on the 23rd of September, and Merudako is on the agenda I, tentatively. Um, it's not out yet, but that's what we were thinking about to follow up on those discussions from the LTP. So I think the paper that you were talking about, we're good to get it into us, uh, so that might be able to be part of those discussions. I think that would be a good idea. Um, not controlling everything, but I think that's a good idea. Um, and my last question, um, you know, noting that um, I was at the EDS conference yesterday and um, that last session talking about this subject. Um, in terms of, we're, you know, we've got a program ahead of us around our regional uh, policy statement, our coastal plan and the land and water plans. Um, so in that context of plans coming forward and being reviewed, are there any particular policy things that you think could help or that you could put to us that we can consider as part of that um, process? Um, not so much policy, um, but what we are picking up, and I'm sure you are too, is that um, landowners are really uh, um, wanting to respond to the regulatory environment around water, around coastal vegetation. Um, and what we're, what we're actively considering, and we've been actively asked for, is the um, appointment of a, um, a, an independent um, um, environmental um, advisor, a biodiversity planning to work on catchment places. Um, th th I, I don't know how to say this delicately, but it's, I'll, I'll say it bluntly. Um, the, it, there is a history with landowners and and um, authority uh, in, in in terms of. Um, I think the, I think the trust plays a really important brokering role between landowners and the regulations. So instead of having a, 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 a stash or tension, what the trust endeavours to do is to um, enable landowners to support landowners to engage with the regulations in a positive way. Covenanting is one of them um, meeting the but but not come head on um, with the um, um, authorities and, and, and we're seeing it being played out uh, so that doesn't answer your question in terms of the regulations, but it does suggest that we think there's a more positive way of getting um, a, a good result uh, uh, for the, the the important regulations that are that are affecting landowners at the moment. All right. Well, thank you very very much, um, uh, Penny, Penny and Kate. That was an excellent uh, contribution, and just exactly why we have got these forums. And hopefully, and as you heard, we're moving in some positive outcomes and we deal with it by getting the CEO and staff to make a response. And, and so you'll be hearing back from us shortly. So thank you for taking your time today to come here and keep up the great work. It's, it's fantastic. Thank you. Back to the EDS right. conference. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. That's really great. Yeah. Thank you.
I I forgot to move a resolution, Axel, so I shouldn't have got you up so soon. The resolution is you can stay there though, I'll let you stay there. Um, we need somebody to move a resolution that the council receives uh, the public forum matter from the um, Banks Peninsula Conservation Council and Penny Carnaby, and that we refer the matter to the, the chief executive who'll come back to us with uh, some information. So who would like to move that? Moved by uh, Councillor Megan Hand, seconded by Councillor Lan Farn. All those in favour, please say aye. That's carried. Thank you very much. Moving on. Now, I'm not going to say welcome again, so you have to go with that previous welcome. So off you go, Axel. Thank you very much for Indeed, I should push the button next time. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's my pleasure to talk about uh, what the options are to do something about transport emissions in the uh, short term. Um, uh, if I may add to my name, uh, I've actually added another name to it. It's uh, Axel Downard Wilke these days, so uh, but don't be confused by that. Uh, that's all good. Um, so um, first up, I wanted to ask you, hands up, who agrees uh, that there's not enough parking in Christchurch? Nobody keen to put their hand up. Well, I gave, gave a talk the other day, a public talk, uh, um, where I said to uh, the attendees, look, um, uh, my, I would like to suggest to you that there's too much parking in Christchurch, and this is why it's not good for transport outcomes. And uh, that was followed by a three quarter hour discussion afterwards. And there wasn't a single person who disagreed with me after listening to that talk. Now, I haven't got that much time here today. Uh, I wanted to just touch on one uh, little example where somebody has done something really great in New Zealand, and that is uh, down in Queenstown, where the transport agency um, got both the district and the region together. Um, uh, they all locked themselves in the room until they had a resolution, and the outcome was that the district council introduced paid parking in areas where commuters were previously parking for free. The income was handed to the uh, region with which a much improved public transport service was being offered. And that happened in late 2017, and within a few months, they had trebled public transport use. So parking is an incredibly powerful tool for changing people's choices, especially commuters. And it's absolutely applicable to Christchurch. That's obviously not something that you have control over. Um, but uh, just as in Queenstown, it would be good for the authorities to all sit together and actually talk about it and see what could or should be done. And what I suggest is incredibly important is that when you think of this, if this is an option uh, to give some consideration to, don't think of it as a central city initiative. Don't. I would even go as far as suggesting where parking is paid already in the central city, and it's a really small area compared to other cities in the country, uh, just leave it alone. Um, um, I'm talking about everywhere else where parking demand exceeds um, uh, a given figure, say, for example, where more than 80% of the on-street parking is taken up regularly, that is where paid parking ought to be introduced by, by the city. Um, in um, you could then work something out. So the areas where that would apply is the rest of the central city where parking is free or where it's time restricted. Uh, I'm talking about Eddington. I'm talking about Sydenham, Middleton, um, along Blenheim Road, Rickerton, uh, around the big malls. So uh, um, with the uh, improved um, funding, could of course you could use that to improve the uh, frequency of the services that uh, go into those areas, and uh, uh, I don't think you would have a chance of getting anywhere near a trebling 
of public transport numbers in Christchurch because they started off at a much lower base in Queenstown, um, but you would get uh, um, very far with an initiative like that. Um, the second thought that I would like to um, give to you is uh, is what I call um, zone zero and uh, Dion Swix, uh, councillor at the time for the central ward and I were doing uh, trying to make this a happening thing uh, prior to the last local body election. Um, uh, hasn't happened yet. And uh, so before we went public, public with that, we sat down with your staff here and, and said, look, guys, if we were to talk about this uh, in public, what would your um, reaction to this be? And what we were told uh, by the staff was, well, you know, you couldn't actually do this because we have a couple of routes that go through the central city that are above capacity um, in the morning. And uh, wouldn't it be terrible if we added more demand uh, uh, onto those services? And we said, well, isn't that a great problem to have? Too many people wanting to use buses. Why don't we work on that? You know, and one of the things that really pisses me off um, is that Hamilton has pipped us to having double deckers uh, before we get them in Christchurch. Uh, you know, uh, it's uh, it, when you when you look on 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 Twitter, you know, introducing double deckers to the system is something that really excites a lot of people. It really gives uh, a different um, a lot of people have a different uh, attitude to public transport. Once you can sit in a double decker in the front and be king of the road. Um, and um, so I said, well, that's the cheapest way of actually increasing capacity introducing double deckers on those those routes that have capacity problems. But uh, when we then went public, we were told, um, we found out through the newspaper that the biggest staff objection was that, uh, well, we can't do this because uh, it relies on, uh, we don't have a tag off system with our buses. And I said, what? We've already got a zone system. You know, if you uh, uh, sit on the blue line or, 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 or number one these days, uh, and, and enter the bus anywhere, you know, on, on Papua Nui Road, you have to tell the driver whether you're staying within zone one or you're traveling into zone two. What's the difference uh, between um, having a system whereby you introduce something like that for the central city? And so basically, if you don't know the idea, uh, it's very simple. Um, number one, zone zero is available um, for, on buses. Um, I've given you all a map. Uh, and here it is, um, within the orange ring there, the, the central city. So if you enter a bus within the central city and you have a metro card and you tell the driver zone zero, you get the ride for free. And uh, and uh, so there is a much, uh, is, is a great offering of lots of bus routes, uh, many of them with a great number of buses per hour. Uh, a much, much better coverage than the shuttle, which is the red thing in the middle, ever used to have. And I just cannot see the point of spending anything in the vicinity of one to one and a half million per annum to reintroduce the shuttle, which is not public transport, which has nothing to do with the public transport system, uh, and have a, uh, a bus running separate from the buses that we are having already. And so, the underlying transport planning thinking behind zone zero is that we would give people we would give people free public transport within the central city within zone zero if they have the metro card and once they have the this payment system in the hand and they actually interact with how public transport uh, works and where the routes go um, you know what many of them would soon become paying customers traveling outside of zone zero absolutely brilliant marketing ploy um giving people something for free which costs close to nothing because you wouldn't actually lose any uh, any income so so that's um the second idea and the third idea very simple we have a lot of uh, bus priority infrastructure on the ground and the operating hours are absolutely insufficient and it's one of the most frustrating things when you sit on a bus the bus is stuck in traffic because it's 
2.30 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon and the bus lane starts operating at 4. It's just, you know, any research that you can read up on uh, what's most important um, to people wanting to use or using public transport. Number one thing is always reliability. That comes way before um, travel time. If it's reliable, you can plan for it, you can uh, rely on it, that is what really matters. So we're having this infrastructure sitting there and we are not making use to it. And you sit on this bus, it's stuck in traffic and somewhere 200 meters down the road, you can see somebody parked in it and you think, really, is that clever? I don't think so, easy enough. Right, so here, here we go, three ideas, easy to do, wouldn't be too hard, thank you. Thank you very much, Epsil. That um, challenges some of our thinking, doesn't it? So thank you for taking the time and um, it's great to have you in our area with all your obviously interest in public transport and your knowledge. So would anybody like to ask a question? Councillor Megan Hands. Thanks, actually. Thanks for coming in. Um, just a question in terms of your zone zero. I propose you sort of um, explain some of the transport planning rationale around you know, why you would choose to do that. If you were to weigh that against other, say, um, commuter lines or commuter routes from you know, where, that are on high congestion roads, for example, um, how would you know how would that look if if, you, if we had a choice of how do we get people to where they need to go faster and cheaper um, and try and reduce congestion from elsewhere versus having this activity within the central city zone? Can you give comment on that? Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure. Um, this is a no-brainer because it costs close to nothing. Um, the buses are already there. And um, um, what I would do is I would actually go back to what we did until 2012, I think it was April 2012, where we gave out the first Metro card for free. Uh, thank you for reducing the uh, uh, initial cost to $5, uh, much appreciated. Um, going back to making it free. so. So that would cost a little bit of money um, and you might lose a tiny little bit of, of income, but I'm not really sure that there's really too many people who already travel uh, within this area, get on and off in that area. So so that's that's the cost. So it's, it's, it's basically close to nothing. And you have an absolutely brilliant marketing opportunity on your hands. Um, and so I, I just cannot understand why but there, there isn't any weighing up to do. This is just something that you would you would do. And if I um, wanted to uh, get, uh, uh, put a challenge to you, um, I mean, I can just hear the staff say, oh, well, we get uh, end of next year, project next comes along, and then we'll have your take on, take off finally. Uh, stuff it. Uh, your challenge is get it done before project next has come, come along. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Anybody else got a question? I, oh, Councillor Ian McKenzie, and then Councillor. I just can't help but thinking uh, or querying really whether, in fact, any disincentive in terms of providing for parking is just isn't just going to encourage uh, uh, retail development in the areas where there is space for parking, and that all you can effectively do is gut the central city, which already to a large extent has been gutted because of the earthquakes and, uh, and any other disincentive for coming into the central city is just going to further that problem. Yeah, great question. And uh, in, you know, this was a little bit more time. Uh, I could go into a lot more detail. But for example, we did sit down, Dion and I, with the uh, Central City Business Association and discuss this through. And uh, they said to us quite clearly, um, well, two thoughts. Uh, it would be politically absolutely fatal to make this a central city initiative, which is why I'm uh, um, warning against this, because you would create um, uh, an impression um, don't come to the central city. Now, it has to be something that's citywide. Second uh, um, thing that they said was um, there's absolutely zero benefit for our members to have all this parking taken up by our members' staff and those cars sit there all day long, and it would be much preferable 
to have those car parks available for paying customers. And uh, that doesn't just apply to um, areas where parking is currently free. That also applies to areas where parking is currently time restricted. Because many companies, they have a couple of staff on duty, they sit on their desk, uh, um, strategically positioned so that uh, they keep an eye on the road. And when the parking warden comes along every couple of weeks, the call goes out and the whole office, they start shuffling their cars um, in, you know, from one Pete 120 spot to another uh, and keep parking there. And the businesses um, who are in that street and share the area for whom the car park should be there, them is out. So if you put a, um, a modest charge on that, I guarantee you that it would be beneficial for the businesses. And the uh, Central City Business Association has exactly the same attitude. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Vicky, Councillor Vicky Siafu. Yeah, thank, thanks for the ideas. Um, they're all interesting. And I, I met with a uh, Residents Association chair the other day over near University of Canterbury, who was, um, and I asked, you know, if, if there was a parking fee went in in this area, would there not be pushback from residents? Is that a concern? And I, he said no. Because the residents, they may pet, they can, you know, there's mechanisms you can have like paper pass and make it reasonable. Um, that's just one example. But have you spoken to other residents associations and got a sense of what people in those areas might actually think about that? Uh, yes, we, uh, Dion and I, we went to quite a few residents associations. Uh, and uh, uh, obviously, you have to explain the underlying concept of what this is trying to achieve. And it is absolutely vital that the city council. Uh, introduces a residence parking scheme as part of a measure like this. And this is becoming more and more important now that um, many developments don't have to provide any off street parking any longer. So in a residential street, um, you cannot treat um, the residents the same way as a commuter. So the city council has been trialing for the last year or year and a half. Uh, uh, residents parking in a in three streets or uh, somewhere around the old College of Education, uh, and as far as I understand, everybody is happy with this, and that's exactly the way to do it. So you treat residents in their local streets and commuters separately. Thank you, Councillor Edge. Thanks, Axel, for those suggestions. Um, we we have I've got a question, but just to reassure you that. The Greater Christchurch Partnership Council are currently uh, looking at these sort of issues um, in terms of improving the public transport system. And we had a big workshop last week, so we're, we're on to it. And uh, it's interesting your ideas that, that can be thrown in the mix. Thanks. Uh, and just like to know, Axel, have you recently been talking to City Council again about these ideas, or has that been a couple of years ago? Um, not to council as such to individual councillors, yes. But I think um, I don't detect much uh, of an interest on a, you know, a, across the organisation. And I have more hope with this council to actually initiate something like that and uh, talk your uh, fellow elected members at the city uh, into Come on, let's do something. Let's put some meaning to uh, what it means uh, getting our transport emissions start. And by the way, much of this is really, really complex, and there's a lot more to it than you can cover in 10 minutes. So if you want to uh, run a seminar or go into a workshop, I'd be quite happy as long as I'm still in Christchurch, about to move to Golden Bay. Um, I'd be happy to come along and uh, you know spend time with you if you want. Well, thank you very much for the offer. So that was an excellent presentation. So thanks for coming along and giving us those ideas. Uh, we'll just move a resolution now and we'll be getting back to you, by the way. So first of all, we're going to move um, that we receive, the, the, the council receives the public forum matter on the near future transport um, opportunities from Alex, Alex, Alex Axel Wilkie 
and refers the matter to the chief executive who will um, bring it back to us and answer to the, to the person who presented it. So that's moved by uh, Councillor Vicky Southwick and seconded by Councillor Craig Pauling. All those in favour, please say aye. There being nobody against, that's carried. So thanks very much, Axel, that's great. Right, we're up to the formalities on the agenda now. We've got the minutes. Um, are there any issues with the minutes? Or uh, I think we've got the minutes OK. Right, I'll ask, um, I'll move from the chair that we, um, oh, do we move anything about the minutes? I can't even remember. Um, Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's nobody with any that we need to change. All right. So uh, we'll move that there is a true and correct record of the meeting. Although I'll move that from the chair. Do I need a seconder? I'll have a seconder. Councillor Edge. All those in favour, please say aye. There being nobody against, that's carried. Um, we we'll just go to the CE now and see if there's any matters from the past public forums that you'd like to report on. Thanks very much, Stephanie. Well, thank you. And through you, Chair, there are two. Uh, one was that Council heard from uh, Inez Steger and Nikki Snoying from Forest and Bird, and that was in relation to climate change and introduced Rouse's report. We have provided a response with the Chair's just just signed off in the last day or two. So that is going out to them. Um, and that is about greater collaboration and investigating that collaboration in that space. Um, and further, we heard from Mr. Roger Bray with regard to the Mid Canterbury flood event. Um, uh, we have not responded to him yet, and that is because he gave us a very thorough and extraordinarily constructive uh, set of information, and the staff are still working through that in order to provide an equally useful reply uh, and just to, um, uh, I guess, uh, uh, support the fact that there is ongoing conversation about how we improve uh, over time and the staff and the community working together. So we really welcome that and there will be uh, a formal letter of response going shortly, Jenny, within the next week. An excellent uh, response. It's fantastic to hear that um, everybody's working with people that write in because that local knowledge is so valuable. So thank you for um, detailing that to us. Right, we're up to our standing committees now, and the first one we're on page 16, um, and we will hear from uh, the chair of that committee, Tumutaya Yvette Couch-Lewis. You were the chair. Um, so looking at um, asking the council to be able to receive the unconfirmed minutes of the regional hearings committee held on the 8th of July, unless there are any um, questions or uh, comments from the committee that they'd like to make before we ask that. No, thank you then. Then can I please hand back to the chair to ask to have those um, minutes received. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Evie. Uh, who would like to move that? Move by Claire, uh, Councillor Claire Mackay, seconded by Councillor Grant Edge. All those in favour, please say aye. That's Carrie. Thank you very much. Right, we're on page 20 of the agenda, and this time it's the Transport and Urban Development Committee. I'll just ask um, the chair of that committee, um, because his co chairs, Councillor Peter Scott and Councillor Grant Edge. Councillor Peter, would you like to speak? Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Edge and myself, co chair. Yeah, sorry about that. So, Councillor Edge and myself co chair the Transport and Urban De De Development Committee, and I chaired the first meeting of that committee um, on the 1st of July. Uh, and essentially, the information is there from page 20 on, 21 onwards. And I would just like to move uh, the recommendation on page 20 that we receive these unconfirmed minutes of the. Uh, thank you. And I'll call for a seconder. Is there a second? I'll oh, seconded by Councillor Grant. Uh, are there any questions anybody's got about mm -hmm. that? Grant, would you like to ask a question? Yes, thanks. Uh, just um, a clarification um, from staff about on page 23, 
item 5.1 and I wondered if staff have received any um, word from Waikato Kotahi on um, their final decisions about uh, National Land Transport Fund. I'll ask the CE to respond. Thank you through you chair and thank you councillor edge no we have not at this time uh, we are in continued discussions with them and as soon as we do here we will certainly update you as councillors any other questions that people would like to ask uh, about the contents of the report no all right well we'll um i'll pop I had I have had a question offline asked by uh, Councillor Elizabeth McKenzie to the point that whereabouts will the Regional Transport Committee minutes sit? And I think that's quite rightly that we need to include them in this committee's um, minutes. So that's what we'll do. We'll ask staff to do that. That's absolutely where they should be. It gives public visibility and enables our local councillors to keep track of that as well. So that's a great question. So thank you very much for following up on that. Was there anything else anybody wanted to say or speak about? All right, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour, please say aye. Uh, that's carried. Thank you very much. Now we're up to page um, 28 of the agenda. And the item is um, the Huranui Wire, um, the uh, work around the zone committee and uh, disestablishing our zone committee and establishing a new committee working with the Huranui District Council. Um, before we move on, to, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll just um, we'll just go a little bit off track here. And before we move on to the resolutions, um, uh, Councillor Clear, I think you'd like to say something. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Just regarding this item, and I'm happy to come to the recommendations later if, if um, you wish, but just round some background, I just really want to take the opportunity at this point in time to talk to the discharge of the Hiranui Wai Ufa Zone Committee. It was the very first zone committee that was established under the Canterbury Water Management Strategy. And I guess it probably saddens me a little bit that we are discharging this, but I'm quite excited on the other hand that uh, the committee will be replaced by a land and water um, committee uh, as, as a joint committee once again um, from Environment Canterbury and uh, Kirinui District Council in conjunction with the um, Runanga as partners as well with the, the, that apply into that area. So that's quite an exciting opportunity, I think, that we've got going forward. And we have certainly a, a des strong desire from the uh, community in the Huanui district uh, to see this new committee up and established. So I just really want um, to take the opportunity in our council meeting to thank uh, all those uh, community members that have participated in the uh, zone committee since 2000, I think it might have been late 2009, early 2010. As I say, it was the first one that um, got off the ground uh, and have participated right through until now. And certainly also acknowledge the time and effort and the work that um, not only staff from Environment Canterbury, but also um, HDC have put into this. So that's really what I would want to, to make um, very apparent to you today. Well, thank you, uh, Councillor Mackay. I think I'll take that as that you've moved this bunch of resolutions and um, that you're speaking to it. Um, who would like to second it? Yeah, well, just a minute. We'll, we'll get them up on the book and then we'll, um, we'll talk about them in a minute. So um, we'll amend that one. So would you like to, who would like to second it? Anybody? I seconded Councillor Phil Clearwater. Um, so um, we'll take each one as we go along, even though I've done that, we'll take each one as we go along, I think. So we'll just deal with the first one first, uh, discharges um, the committee. So I think that's moved by Councillor McKen uh, Councillor uh, Mackay and seconded by Councillor Phil Clearwater. All those in favour, please say aye. 
Anyone against? That's carried. Okay, number two, uh, we're acknowledging that the uh, the members uh, who have passed and present, and we'll move, have that moved by Councillor um, Mackay and seconded by Councillor Clearwater. It, would anybody else like to speak to that resolution? Well, I'd certainly like to say a few words and say thank you very much to all the people from the community and all the other stakeholders who have been involved all this time. It's fabulous that you've been giving that community service and I think um, it's on behalf of the whole community and I think um, following uh, Councillor Mackay, we need to really acknowledge those people and thank them. So I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour, please say aye. Anybody opposed? There being nobody opposed, that's carried. Um, now, number three is we're, what we're doing here is we're working with um, the District Council and we're working with uh, the Runanga in Kaikoura and in um, Tuhiriri, um and to co-design the uh, way this will go forward. Uh, so um, this will also be moved by Councillor um, Mackay and seconded by Councillor Phil Clearwater. Would you like to speak to it, Phil? Yeah. Yeah. I know we get some, um, some really good um, information and discussion around in the briefings around this, but I just wanted, especially because it's going to be co designed, just and like I'm referring to um, page 30 point B there, number 16, that um, the Joint Committee would have a different membership, obviously, at, uh, and a different focus. And I just wondered if Murray or Claire might just perhaps clarify the way we see the focus at this stage. Larry's sitting in the room, but I think probably the important uh, words uh, to draw people's attention to is in point 11, where it just talks about building on the previous work of the zone committee and recognising the, the vision of the Canterbury Water Management Strategy. B, around the concept of maintaining and enhancing the heartbeat of the land within the principles of Te Manu Ato Wai, um, and of the land, um, the whenua, and under the cloak of Te Manu o Te Taio. So, um, you know, there's quite some quite strong um, principles there, or concept, and also you've got quite a, a long concept drawn out in um, 11C there, which I won't take the time to read, but just draw your attention to it. And uh, maybe Murray, if you'd like to, well, yeah, if you'd like to come to the table, Murray, you can, anything you'd like to tell us about it, really, over to you. Thank you. Well, we're through the chair. I, I guess the the other thing to perhaps add to what Councillor Mackay said is the the next step. I think is very much a co-design um, opportunity for a uh, representative of this council to work with. Uh, representatives from HTC and the Tūrunanga um, on what has been a draft terms of reference that was uh, um, tabled with you earlier in the year, I think around March, April. Um, so I think it's really an opportunity to kind of review that terms of reference that they've developed, but yeah, put a fresh lens on it and look at it really from a co-design point of view. Um, so um, the, there's a basis, it, it's reasonably similar in, it, in its structure to what proceeded in terms of the, the Water Zone Committee's terms of reference, but with a slightly different emphasis. And, and Councillor McClough just pointed out some of the additional, I guess, uh, emerging uh, reference points for the for that committee. But certainly the next phase is, a, I guess, a chance to review that again um, in conjunction with Runanga representation and the, the District Council. Oh, thank you very much, Murray. Yeah, I don't want to be too harsh on, in my comments here, but at first blush, this seems to be a cut and run from us um, to me. I know there are some things in behind that. My question is the funding that we put in the zone committees, will that still apply to the Huranui zone committee? I understand it. Well, Murray, do you want to say something? Well, through the chair, the uh, what's come through the long term plan in terms of a community engagement fund, uh, my understanding from um, discussing this with Caroline Hart before she went on to comment is that that would be um, available for the Hiranui, uh Water and Land Committee or the new committee. So it gives us an opportunity to um, support that committee as it establishes with with funding that which is available without uh, throughout the rest of Canterbury as well. So uh, the facilitation component 
uh, of the support will be provided from Haranui rather than from Environment Canterbury. So there is, an, in terms of that immediate support that we're providing to the water zone committees, that's not required in the same way in the Haranui. But um, I guess our ongoing work programs still remain in place across the Haranui, and that new fund is certainly available for that new committee to, to draw from as well. Oh, thank you, Murray. Uh, Councillor Craig Pauling. Oh, just... oh, yeah, sorry, do you want to keep going? You go. I, I don't want to keep going, but I just want to dig a little deeper there. Um, so in, in terms of the money, money that we're looking at in our long-term plan in terms of giving, you know, allowing zone committees to have uh, some independence over in terms of their spending, does that money, will that money, you don't need to answer this if you don't know, but does that money still sit with the zone committee? Because my personal opinion on this is that we need to be a bit firm on this. Uh, is there anything you want to say to that, Murray? Or you? Well, through the chair, I, the, the approach to that fund, I guess, does follow on from the way immediate steps was provided um, to committees, which is it, it stays as an environment Canterbury fund to distribute and maintain. So the the recommendations or, or priorities that are set by his own committee. So to some extent, the responsibility for that fund sits still with Environment Canterbury. OK, thank you. All right, Councillor Craig Pauling. Thanks. Um, yeah, first of all, just want to go back and uh, acknowledge the uh, previous uh, uh, UFA zone committee, uh, like others have done, and the work that they've been involved with over the past decade or so. Um, and yet, like Claire, saddened to see it discharged, but I think it's um, beholden on us to work collaboratively with our uh, TLA partner and Mana Whenua partners. And so this has been a drive from Hiranui District Council to do something differently, and I think that's good. Um, although it's really important that we keep that connection to the CWMS, which we have done through our discussions with them, to keep that in the terms of reference, um, as well as the Mural Forum oversight as well. So I think that's really important, and that's what our role can be in that is to make sure that that's uh, uh, upheld. Um, I note, in, and this sort of goes towards Peter's um, questioning, I note that in recommendation three, it's the, the new Hiranui Water and Land Committee will still be a joint committee of Hiranui District Council and Environment Canterbury, which I think is important as well. We don't, let's not lose sight of that this is a joint committee. It's been uh, their initiative, um, and we have to support that uh, really as, as a regional council. Um, but it's still a joint committee, so those um, things around the joint resourcing and facilitation of the program of the committee, I still think is important to work through. I don't think we're quite there yet, um, but I think that's something that we can do in these next uh, discussions with them, uh, which is part of uh, recommendation three about working together with the council and the Runei to see where that lands. So that's what I'm anticipating, um, that those things have to sort of still be ironed out a little bit, um, but the point that it's a joint committee is really important and we shouldn't lose sight of that. So, yeah. Thank you, uh, Councillor Pauling. And a report will be coming back once it's sorted out for us to establish our joint part. So that'll be good. Councillor Mackay. I think if I could just also add in the context that this these committees, and particularly being a joint committee, will be within the context of our regional delivery uh, work programs as well. So they're not standalone uh, necessarily, and certainly the intent from the discussions that we've had to date, and certainly the small group before, um, we're perhaps just elevating to a little bit more strategic level, but we're acknowledging that um, the on the ground actions will be driven by other people as well. So, um, and, and you know, the re and, and the, the work that Environment Canterbury currently does out in the in the district. All right. Well, thank you. Do you want to ask another question, Craig? That's all right. Go ahead. Follow on from what Claire said. Um, the other thing I think is really important to note here around this decision is that I think one of the um, things over time around the CVMS has been the role of the TLAs uh, in leading. And I think this is a good good example of where one of the TLAs have gone, well, we want to do a bit more in this space, so we're going to do something. So I think that's a positive thing. I think that should be acknowledged as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, we should acknowledge them as well. That's a very good contribution. Oh, thank you very much, Murray. That's excellent. Thanks for coming to the table. Um, now, with um, Resolution 4, 
Um, and I'm glad we just had that discussion because that means everybody's on the same page about what we what's happened and what we're doing and what we expect to happen next. So that's good. Now, um, we've asked to appoint a councillor uh, to work with this group now around the setting up. That'll be different to once we establish the committee. It'll be like a person on the zone committee and like Claire was on the old zones committee. So we'll probably just um, go with that same. Uh, function there, I think. Um, but with this one, I think because we're working so closely with the Tumu Taya at our table and in our work, um, it's a really good opportunity for um, uh, Mana Whenua to have strong input into the, the work of this new committee. Uh, so I would like to suggest that, um, first of all, I'll um, I'll um, get a mover and second for this number four that's on the council, and then I'm going to amend it. So, um, uh, who would uh, who would like to move appoints a councillor um, to be? Um, yeah, well, we already moved that and it's seconded. Okay, um, I will move an amendment to that, and I would like it to see it for a second for the words appoints councillor Craig Pauling working with Tumu Taya Yay and Cranwell to be Environment Canterbury's representative for the co design of the Hiranui Water and Land Committee. Uh, is there anybody prepared to second that? Second by councillor Craig Pauling. Craig Pauling, get someone else. Councillor Grant Edge will um, move that. Um, so it's so that's so that there's flexibility there. I've left a message on uh, the mayor's phone around this. I can't get to it at the moment. We have had some advice from staff that they already decided to have one, but I think this gives us flexibility. Uh, so all that. Would anybody like to speak to that? Grant, Andy. Yeah, just yeah. I'm supportive of of this idea. I think that uh, to Matteo uh, advice to councillors uh, is is essential. It has been around this table, and I think in the development and co-design process, I think that'd be invaluable. Uh, working with those other two runanga um, and providing those contributions, I think the advice in that co in that co-development is is going to be really useful. Um, And especially, I think, in our discussion previously on item 11, um, uh, where we have Tamana Otawai and those sort of issues that come into it too. And I think that that's, that's sort of reading in my mind that that's going to be an important role. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Craig Pauling, would you like to speak as well? I just really support what Grant's just said there. Um, you know, with the with the co-design that's got to go forward uh, between the council, uh, Hiranui and uh, Furunga or Kaikoura and Atenai Tuhuri Runanga, um, I just think it makes sense for us to have our Tumu Tile there with us. Um, it's an issue that uh, involves our two Runanga there, and um, yeah, I just don't see why we wouldn't involve them in this process. And yes, it's uh, difficult that we haven't been able to run it past um, Hiranui, but I hopefully they will trust us. Uh, and our judgment on um, bringing a, a bit more support around the table to, to that process. Thank you, Councillor Pauling. Uh, Tumu Taya Yvette. Kia ora, and I'd just like to start by um, thanking the Council in terms of considering to um, you know, put a Tumu Taya um, role within this really important space that we're looking at. It's, um, it is a change and I'd like to acknowledge Claire's first comment when she first opened in terms of looking at discharging, but we're going forward into a whole new realm and the importance of moving, putting our best foot forward um, and ensuring that we are right up there within that space, but allowing growth to actually occur within this new era that we're actually going into within the Hidanui. And having a Tumu Tile role within that space, working alongside Papa Tipu Runaka, um, is a very good move. So thank you very much and um, look forward um, to hearing further discussions on this. Kia ora. Uh, thank you, um, Yvette. Anybody else want to speak? All right, I'll put that resolution. This become the substantive motion now. Uh, all those in favour, please say aye. Uh, there's been nobody opposed. That's carried. Thank you very much, everyone. And we'll look forward to hearing back from the developments. Uh, Councillor Pauling. 
Uh, I, I checked with um, our secretary and she said yes. So I was having a similar thought. So there we go. Um, right, page 32. We have got the report of Audit New Zealand as the annual report, uh, audit plan and long term plan. I just might ask Catherine if she would like to come to the table and uh, tell us a few words about what this all means. Thank you very much, Catherine. Tenakato. Um, I'm pleased to present this. Um, it's got three particular parts to it around uh, providing you with the audit plan for the uh, coming uh, audit for the year ended 30 June 2021. Uh, we also are providing you with the letter that Audit New Zealand require that for you to agree the chair to sign in relation to the fees for that audit. And uh, we're providing you with the report from the long term plan audit that happened. Um, there are four recommendations. The first one relates to receiving the audit plan. The second one relates to the uh, fees letter, proposed fees letter. The third one uh, requests approval for the chair to sign that fees letter. Uh, the fourth one relates to receiving the audit report from the long term plan. And the fifth one is acknowledging the six recommendations that have come from that uh, audit report for the long term plan. Thank you, Catherine. We'll just see if there's any questions anybody's got around um, this report um, that they would like to ask you as the leading staff member. Any questions? Councillor Phil Clearwater. Thank you, Catherine. Just like um, in on page 34 in reference to number 17 there and the, uh, and the specific points that are raised uh, um, in, in the white pages, um, I'm just wondering, is there, are some of those recommendations really asking us to, to have our long term financial plan um, aligned with our infrastructure strategy? And would we be a and should we perhaps receive more information about the infrastructure strategy um, when it when it comes to the time of our annual plan? The infrastructure strategy is updated on an ongoing basis and it's a piece of work that we're doing as part of the normal work within ECAN. Um, uh, our infrastructure strategy obviously covers a, a longer term time frame than necessarily the long term plan. And so uh, this is just uh, Audit New Zealand. We're acknowledging that they would like to see a greater emphasis on those aspects of it, which we are now taking into the um, operations area as far as uh, that goes. Uh, thank you. Just, uh, I guess, a future looking question, Catherine, in terms of the, cap the capability and capacity of Audit New Zealand, uh, given the shortage of auditors around. The process. If we were looking out in terms of our processes over the next 12 months, I would like to, through partner, possibly ask uh, what the risk is of us not achieving the things we need to achieve on the dates we need to achieve them. Because it seems to me that um, there's a bit of a highlight there that people are coming coming under more and more pressure in terms of uh, what's going forward, and especially some of the uh, issues that we have the statutory stuff that we possibly have in front of us around three wars and other things, there's going to be a lot of pressure on. Um, Audit New Zealand have um, formally written to us to advise that there may be delays. They are aiming to keep to our schedule for the audit report. Um, Parliament has uh, agreed, as they did last year, to extend the deadline out for receiving of audit reports. So, um, uh, we're, we're aiming to, and we found that they worked very well with us through the long term plan process and uh, are endeavouring to keep within their timeframes. Is that answering yes, your question? It certainly does. Uh, I know that we're shuffling the deck in terms of our finance responsibilities going forward. And we've got new people starting, and, and, um, and I would just like to put this in front of par that this is something that we need to pay attention to. Uh, it's uh, performance audit and risk. Audit is always a risk if we can't get the other end of it. All right, thank you, Councillor Scott. Any other councillors wishing to ask Catherine any questions about this? Uh, Councillor Chair of Bar, have you got? Do you want to say anything? Everything good? Yeah, sure. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you very much, Catherine. That's really good.
I'd like to call for a um, mover. This is moved by Councillor John Sunkel, seconded by Councillor Peter Scott. Um, is there anybody wanting to speak to, about this? Do you want to speak, John? What about you, Peter? No? No? Nobody wants to speak? Oh. I'm, I, I, I guess the only thing I would say here is that we were a bit pushed during our LTP process and for a variety of reasons. Um, COVID and other things, uh, but it seemed that um, one of the missing bits may have been the audit report, you know, that, that we didn't get to lay our eyes on it, and I think that's a concern that you share, Nicole, also. So I, I just think that there is some stuff there around auditing that we just need to get our head straight on, and possibly you know, we'll have the opportunity in the next couple of months to do that in terms of, yeah, so that's just a comment. I thank you, Councillor Grant. Would you like to speak? Yes, yeah, so that the LTP process was very rushed toward the end, but I, my understanding is that the staff and the auditors had lots of correspondence in the lead up to the LTP, um, gave quite a bit of direction during that process and things were incorporated in the LTP. Um, and really it's, it's, um, it's just a bit of fine tuning and it's a bit of management issues on those um, remaining recommendations um, that can be put to the um, uh, audit uh, Finance and Risk Committee and uh, to discuss further. Right, thank you very much. Anybody else wanting to comment? Okay, well, I'll, um, I'll, I've got a mover and a seconder. We'll move it as one block. Everybody's clear about what we're moving. All those in favour, please say aye. <coughs> Anybody opposed? There being nobody opposed, that's carried. Thank you very much, everybody. We're moving on to this bit of a technical part of the meeting now. So we need a mover that I'll move from the chair that we move into public excluded. Um, I'll have a seconder for that, seconded by Councillor John Sunkel. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Uh, all the staff who aren't supposed to be here need to leave the room, please. Uh, if you do that, that'd be great. And um, uh, the person who's the member of public, thank you for... No, no, that's right. Just that we haven't got anything. Other, there being no other business, there's no notices of motions. There's no question on notice. Uh, the next meeting of the council will be held on the 26th of August. And um, I'll invite um, Yang, Timu Taya, Yang Kremel to close the meeting. Thank you. Atena tatu katoa, nei anot te mihi ki a koutou waha waha mui te nei te nei hui he rawe he rawe te hui a he fakarongo i a koutou i te i te pa 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 to reo huri ranga te nei fari no reira a te nei koutou ki a koe te te sumaki ki a koe a jini te nei koe moto mahi he he fakahari i te nei ra koutou katoa nga kai mahi huri no huri no a te nei tatu katoa a reira reira mihi nei tatu mo te he te fakakapi te hui nei no reira Unu here, unu here, unu here, kituru tapa nui a tāne, ki a wāti, ki a māma, te kākau, te tīnana, te wairua, te aratakata, e koe rā, e roko, whakareaki, ki ruka, ki a tīna. Aumie huie tāi ki a 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 tāi ki